today we are going to uh, throw some light on finite volume method, CFD, MC++, what are all these things uh, doing together. And um, finite volume method is one of the most widely used methods in CFD. And uh, what is the advantage of using finite volume method for simulating fluid flows? And how we can do it using C++ is what we are going to see. We will try to touch upon the fundamental aspects of uh, simulating fluid flows using uh, finite volume method and how we can write our own codes, what is the advantage of that, um, how we can do that and why we need to do that. All those, uh, we'll try to get answers for all those questions through this webinar. So during the course of this webinar, we'll be starting with the numerical modeling first. What is numerical modeling? Why numerical models are used? What is the benefit of using numerical models? We'll try to see there. And then we will move on to computational fluid dynamics, which is also a numerical modeling method used for simulating the fluid flows. Then we will move on to finite volume method, which is used for simulating these uh, fluid flows. So it's I would say it's a part of CFD. And then we will have a look at some of the commercial finite volume method codes which are available in the market and with the different capabilities, how they are used and, um, and so on and so forth. Then we will move on to pre and post processing tools which are used uh, for, prepare, uh, for preparing the geometry and uh, for a fluid flow. And once we have the simulation done, how to have a look at the results and how to make some conclusions out of it. Um, so for all these purposes, we'll be using pre and post processing tools and we'll have a look at those tools and then why we should be using C++ for simulating the, uh, for writing our own codes uh, for the finite volume method and how it is going to help us in finding the solution for a real world problem um, or how it can help in uh, finding a solution of our own will be understood there and uh, last but not least we will touch upon the future prospects that are available uh, once we are good at uh, writing c++ codes for finite volume method and simulating the fluid flows basically so these are the main topics that i will be touching upon in this webinar today so the first one is numerical modeling so if you take any real world problem if we want to go for a numerical model. So first of all, why do we need numerical model? So if you take any real world problem, for example, I have a huge building, I am planning to construct a building of, let's say, uh, some 200 or 300 floors, which is more than 1.5 kilometer height, which is very huge. So what are the things that I have to keep in mind? Then how I can convert it into a, a simple problem. So, if you take the example of the same building, what I was just mentioning about, which is uh, uh, which is at a height of one kilometer or one point five kilometer for that matter. So, the thing, the first thing that will come to my mind is the load that is coming onto this building because of the wind. So, that's the first thing that I have to address. When the wind load, I know. Once I know the wind load that is coming onto it, I have to think about the environmental conditions that are prevailing at different heights. So these are, and then starting from that, I can consider this, I can simplify this problem into a, uh, a kind of cantilever beam, which is fixed at the bottom, and which is subjected to some distributed load upon the, uh, along the height of the building. That's what we can uh, simplify it into. But if I do this simplification, there are many things that would be missing there. If I say a cantilever beam, I have to fix a cross section for that. Then I have to um, I have to mention how the cross section is changing at least. If there are any extra provisions that are made on the building, that for example for landing a helicopter or for landing any um, the water tanks that will be existing at the top and so on and so forth. So then I have to keep in mind how much load they are going to 
add on to the building and so on and so forth. So these things, uh, if we are going for a simple model like a cantilever, these things might be missing there. If I go for a little bit more complicated problem, I can try to make it as, as realistic as possible, uh, the shape of the building. But then the loading, when it, when it comes to the loading, I can say that the loading is only constant. It is not uh, varying over time, which is not, uh, again, realistic. But uh, the structure is realistic in nature. So there are different types of simplifications I do. I can convert this model into uh, a small uh, cantilever beam problem, or I can convert it into a fluid flow problem where the wind is flowing around the building. and um, I can make it even more complicated by looking at uh, various environmental conditions prevailing there and uh, what effect they are going to have on the material that is used in the building and so on and so forth. So basically, I have taken one real world problem and I converted it into a real problem. And the level of simplification depends on the use or the solution that I am looking for. So once I have this simplification done, this real world problem, which is converted into a real problem, is then converted into a set of mathematical equations. If I am talking about a fluid flow, I will convert it into a set of maybe strokes equations. If I am talking about a cantilever beam, I would like to formulate it as a strength of materials problem. And once I have done that, I have to go for the numerical model. So that means once the mathematical model is ready for me, I can say that uh, it's one in the same uh, mathematical model or the numerical model. So once we have this numerical model, you can use numerical methods which are used for solving these equations. In the coming slides, I will explain you how this numerical model can be, um, or a real world problem can be converted to a numerical model and then solved using numerical methods. So once you use these numerical methods, uh, you will get a solution. For example, how much deflection is happening with respect to the building is what I'm looking for. Then I can take a simple cantilever problem and apply the load on it and see how much deflection is actually happening there at the tip of the building. Is it feasible enough or not? And what is the maximum height I can go with that uh, particular cross section? So. If I'm looking for the deflection, then yes, I'm going to use a numerical model, which is going to solve the cantilever problem for me. And I use different numerical methods for solving it. So once I have the numerical solution, then I go for the <coughs> interpretation of these results. In the interpretation of these results, I will try to understand what actually is happening with the variable, how it is changing over time, and are there any points of concern for me and how I need to go ahead, go about with that. So once the interpretation is done, we can compare the results with the real world problem and we will see that if the results, what we see in the real world are matching with the interpreted solutions or the interpreted <coughs> so, uh, answers that we got for the variables. If they are matching, we will say that the real world problem is properly simulated. If not, we will try to make some changes in the simplification process and the cycle will continue till we get a uh, correct solution, which is representing the real world problem based on the solution what we are looking forward to. So once we have this numerical model, so we'll take one small example here. So for example, a person is doing a skydiving, let's say. So he has opened his parachute and he is trying to um, reach the earth. So when he is reaching the earth, initially it's a free fall. So where there is only gravity load working on his body and a very little drag because of the air that is coming in the opposite direction. But once he opens the parachute, he is going to have some resistance because of the air and this resistance of air is considerable enough because uh, the parachute has a considerable area of cross section which is obstructing the flow of the air. So once this comes into picture, the person still will be falling down but still he needs to, uh, but his ve the velocity with which he will be falling down will be reduced. 
uh, will be brought under control. So if I want to know what is the velocity with which the person is coming onto the ground once he opens the parachute, then I need to have an equation for that. So the real world problem is the person landing onto the ground using a parachute. And the thing I would like to know there is the velocity with which he is coming down and what will be the velocity when he is about to land on the ground. Two things. And then based on this, I have to convert it into a mathematical model. So the solution I'm looking for is the velocity, how the velocity is changing over time. So for this, I can write a formula which is based on um, the second law of Newton. So here we have F equal to M A. So that's the total force that is acting on the body and which is equal to mass times acceleration. We all know this formula very well. So once we have F equal to M A, so what are the forces that are acting on the person? There is a gravity load which is pulling the person down. That is Fg that is represented here using Fg, which is nothing but the mass of the body of the person multiplied by the acceleration into gravity. So once we have Fg, we can calculate Fr also, which is based on the cross-section area of the parachute. So based on the cross-section area of the parachute, we can calculate the drag coefficient, which is C. And then we know the velocity with which the person is moving down or the velocity with which the air is moving up. Um, so once we have those values, we can see that FR is acting in the opposite direction. So we take a negative sign there. So minus CV square and FG, which is acting downwards, taken in the positive direction, that is MG. So this is the net force that is acting on the person. The person is not in equilibrium. He's, uh, if he is neither moving up nor falling down, then we can say that mg is equal to cv square and we can calculate what is the velocity with which the air is flowing there. But that's not the case. The person is coming down. So we have a resultant force that is acting in the downward direction. So the resultant force which is acting in the downward direction here is given by f is equal to fr plus fg where f is the resultant force. R is the uh, air resistance, the force due to air resistance and Fg is the force due to the uh, gravitational load. So this force is not constant, this is changing over time because the person is not subjected to a constant acceleration. So we can write this as m into a here. So we have m a here. So this force can be replaced using m a. But this acceleration is nothing but dv by dt, which is change in velocity with respect to time. So we can write m into dv by dt. Okay, so I can write here as this m into dv by dt is nothing but minus cv square plus mg. I can rearrange the terms a little bit here so that I can bring the m here. So this m will come here. So I can strike off the m here. And this m is also a pound. So I have minus cv square by m plus g as dv by dt. So this is one of the typical uh, formulas, uh, typical uh, structure you get when you are solving differential equations in mathematics. So there are theoretical ways of solving this one. So if you try to find a solution, so dv by dt is, it's like, you can compare this equation to an equation of the form uh, dy by dx is equal to a minus or a plus b into y square. Okay, if this is of this form, then I can say y in terms of x using this formulation. So this is a standard formulation which is available when we are solving the theoretical models. Then velocity is given by gm by c into 1 minus e power minus c by m into t. This minus c by m is nothing but the value that we are getting here. That is this value. This b value is nothing but what you are seeing here. This is this b value. 
and we also have A, which is nothing but G M by C here. Okay, so we are taking this as constant. So we have this equation. If we rearrange these terms, you can write it as um, okay, G M by C. Okay. Uh, the first term will come to something like gm plus c, which is equal to our a, what we are looking at here. Okay. So once we find the solution, here we have v of v, which is dependent on time, that is the velocity which is dependent on time, that means the velocity is changing over time. Mind you, if it is not changing with time, then I can say dv by dt is not changing, velocity is not changing with respect to time, that means this is going to be zero for Okay, so that's not the scenario what we are looking at. We are considering that the velocity is changing over time, which is a more realistic scenario. And then we have the independent variable t, that is time, which is not dependent on any of these things. And we are able to calculate the velocity, which is based on time, and other functions like g, which is a constant, of course, but mass, also a constant, c, which is de dependent on the Cross section area that is uh, obstructing the flow uh, or the movement of the parachute. And we also have parameters like C by M, which are defining the change in velocity with respect to time. Okay. This is a, a theoretical way of solving the problem. So, if you take the theoretical solution, so if I take uh, try to we'll try to get a feel for the velocity change that we are seeing here. So if I take g equal to 9.81 meters per second and c as 10 kg per second, which is the drag, uh, and mass is taken as 80 kgs. For example, the person is uh, 80 kilos weight, let's say. So we take mass as 80. Then if I try to implement it here, when t is equal to 0, this is e power 0, which is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, so velocity becomes 0 for me, and t equal to 0. So if I keep on substituting t equal to 2, 4, 6, 8, and 12, I have different values. These are the theoretical values which are very accurate. Nothing to uh, modify them or correct them there. And if I go for time equal to infinity, that means 1 by 0 here. Uh, so 1 by infinity, and, uh, that will be 0 here. So 1 minus 0. So totally velocity will be independent of time there, which is nothing but gm by c. Uh, so gm by c will come to 78.48 if you can calculate that. So this, these are the theoretical calculations that we have. So if I try to do a numerical model here, what I will try to do is, um, I will take the equation what I have got initially, that is dv by dt is equal to g minus cm by c by m into v square. So I am going to write that as dv by dt as velocity at time t plus 1 minus velocity at time t i. So um, I'm taking the change in velocity over change in time here. Okay. So velocity t i plus 1 minus velocity at t i divided by change in time. So once I have these values, I can rearrange the terms here time also, so we have here in the equation c by m into v square, so velocity again has to be taken at t i, so that is taken here and g by m minus, um, so by rearranging the terms here, this t i plus 1 minus t i, which I can also write it as delta t, okay, so this delta t will be coming here. Okay, and um, this uh, minus v of t i will be coming on to the other side. So this is minus and becomes plus here. So we have v of t i. So rearranging the terms, you have this value. So if I know the velocity at one point of time, I can calculate the velocity at the next point of time. So what should be i plus 1 and i? So if I take a time step size of 2 seconds, so I am taking t i plus 1 minus t i is equal to 2 seconds. So how the velocity is changing in the numerical method for me. So I am taking 
at t equal to zero, velocity is zero. That's the starting point for me. So this becomes i becomes zero here now, and uh, t one. So t one minus t naught is two seconds. Since t naught is zero, t one will become two for me, and uh, velocity at t zero. So the velocity at t zero is zero for me. So this will become zero. So this will also become zero here because velocity is zero there at time t naught, and I can calculate what is t i plus one. That is t one. Okay, this is t one. So t one or velocity at two seconds will become nineteen point six two. Similarly, I can calculate for four, six, four, eight, ten, twelve, and different values are given. Let's try to calculate it using a delta t of. I can use any time step here. I can use t i minus t i plus one minus t i is equal to one second. If it is taken as one second, we can see that the values are. Um, so to start with, I have zero. T zero is there. Then t one at one second. I have t two at two seconds. So t two at two seconds will be equal to velocity at. T two will be equal to eighteen point three. You can do a small math there. You will be able to see what I am talking about. So, if you observe by taking delta t is equal to one second, you are getting eighteen point three nine. By taking delta t equal to two seconds, you are getting nineteen point six two. So, and the actual velocity is seventeen point three six, which we got there. So, this you can see that the value started with. Um, 19.62 reduce it to 18.39. If you take delta t equal to 0.5 seconds, let us say, then that will be even closer to 70.36. So the smaller the delta t value, the closer the value will be to the theoretical value. So we can make two important conclusions here. One is you can say that this is going to The method is highly dependent. Numerical method is highly dependent on delta t. That's first thing. Second thing, we can without even knowing the theoretical formula, without using this theoretical formula, what we had, we can cal calculate the velocity change over time by using the right values for delta. So, if we look at computational fluid dynamics, there are three aspects of fluid dynamics to start with. The first one, the first and foremost one. I would say is analytical fluid dynamics, which started uh, quite some time ago. People started using different analytical methods for coming up with a solution uh, for the mathematical models. Then we have experimental fluid dynamics, which we use for uh, we do some experiment, try to understand the phenomena there, and come up with the formulation there, where we come up with an empirical formula there. Then we have computational fluid dynamics. Uh, which is more recent than the other two, wherein we are using computer methods or numerical methods for solving the equations of fluid dynamics. Let's briefly look at some of the aspects of computational fluid dynamics here. So these are the experimental techniques what we are having here. So for example, if you want to look at the flow through uh, a blood vessel, so you take the model there and you will see where the For example, the blood is entering into the vessel and how it is flowing, where it is getting stuck. So all these things, parameters can be evaluated using the experiments. And in the second one, you can see there is a wind tunnel where there is a air intake that is coming from this side, and you have a small car model here, which is studied for its drag and uh, aerodynamic performance. Based on the flow that is passing over the particular vehicle here, and you have an outtake air outtake that means when the air will be leaving the chamber. So this is one typical wind tunnel test, and even for applying pressure on some of the materials and giving a shape to the body, uh, which is more I would say a fluid structure interaction problem, which is. Model using a machine. So all these things are experimental means of understanding a phenomena or performing a operation. And these experiments 
will give us results only to some extent. For example, if I want to know what is the temperature at a particular location somewhere in the middle of the year, might not be possible for me. I can put a probe here and try to get the temperature here, but this probe will cause some hindrance to the flow that is passing through this uh, area. So whenever I go for experimental means, there are a lot of limitations and uh, a lot of care that needs to be taken when we are going for experiments. And quite often it so happens that we will not be able to capture or, or we will not be able to understand the phenomena completely using the experiments. And analytical fluid dynamics has its own set of limitations in the sense, for example, if you take the continuity equation, so we know the continuity equation is given by uh, AV equal to constant, that is area multiplied by velocity is equal to constant, or if we are taking from between two points, A1 and A2, that is point one and point two, we know the difference between uh, the velocities here and the area of cross sections is proportional to one another, that is um, the area of cross section and the velocity at one end. If there aren't any pressure changes, of the material that is flowing, then the, the density will remain constant here. We can strike off the density and we can say that A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. But this is very easy to say, but if, we, if I am going for a cross-section which is having a complex cross-section area, then I always face the difficulty in calculating the A1 or I can end up calculating the value which is very low. Uh, uh, which is error prone. And same is the question, uh, case with A2. So at the other side, whatever the cross section we are seeing, if it is a regular cross section, it's very easy to calculate. Otherwise, it will create some problems for us. Similarly, if we look at the Bernoulli's theorem also, so between two points, what is the pressure change uh, can be calculated based on the difference in heights and uh, difference in the velocities that you observe there based on that you can do it. But again, it has its own set of uh, complications when we try to do it and uh, the compressibility aspects, everything will be coming into picture here.